I think I found my book of the year and I'm going to talk to you all about it. Welcome back to the channel. It is good to be back. I've had to take a bit of a month off just to deal with some um, some family emergency that was not very nice, but everything is calming down and going back to normal now. So hopefully I can get some videos out with more frequency. And I am coming back with one heck of a book. Um, and this book I am going to be reviewing today is the Wingspan of Treason by L. N. Bayon, and this is a advanced reader copy that she sent me probably just over a month ago. And I'm not going to lie, I only read two books during October because of the stress I was going through with the family. But uh, I read two books. I finished two books. Um, one of them was a, a book by C. T. Phipps, who are, and I'll be reviewing that book. Uh, very soon and the other book was this and I've got to tell you this really got me through a hell of a tough month. The world and the characters in this were so so immersing, so real and such a breath of fresh air from the traditional kind of western style fantasy that you get. This has a very different vibe, a very different setting and just the cultural, spiritual, political um, undertones that run through this book, I think really reflect the setting that it's in. And I finished this book uh, yesterday and I'm already miss I'm missing the characters already. I'm missing the people, I'm missing the world, I am missing the writing and I'm gonna get to Bayon's writing uh, very soon. But what I'm gonna talk to you about first is the world building. Now, Ellen Bayon has created an absolutely massive world. Um, I mean, look at this. This is this is the map. Uh, this is a copy of a map. Try and get a good view. There you go. It's a copy of a map that uh, that came with the Ark, and it's the world is absolutely massive. And literally, the story, this book, it's a biggie as well. Literally, only takes part in that tiny little bit there. So we get, uh, the first part of the story is in Envil Envilmar, which is kind of classed as the north in the book. And then the majority of the story takes place in Dorinda, which is the kind of uh, desert type country, which is, yeah, the, the majority of the story holds in there. But look how big the map is, the potentiality for to explore all the rest of the cultures and countries and people that I'm really, really hoping um, Bayon explores. I mean, the potentiality there is massive. So it's not just the it's not just the kind of epic scale of the actual size of the geography. It's also the richness and the depth of which she builds these worlds. She builds it through the characters. She builds it through the environment, and it it, it just it feels alive. It's living and breathing. It is. I mean, at times I just feel like I am walking through that landscape and feeling the warmth of the sun, feeling the sand through my fingers. Um, it might sound corny, but literally that is how what is what that is how a writing kind of immerses me in that world. And there's very um, there's very distinct uh, socio-political and cultural differences between Envilmar and Dorinda. Uh, she separates them very very well very distinctly um the people are very different their beliefs are very different their temperament is very different and their spirituality is very very different and this difference in the cultures and the political structures of Invilmar and Dorinda is what makes the uh is, is kind of what makes the characters uh, have agency, have an interaction with the environment. So we follow three three main characters. I mean, the book itself has an absolutely massive, massive cast. There's a lot of names to remember. There's a lot of people that you meet. And I think if you, if you do struggle with many, many characters and many names, you might struggle a little bit here. But I actually think that Bayon gives each character such 
a kind of 3D personality and such a distinct personality that it, I think it's very, very easy to remember the people. The names, I think, are very... Because the names are very different, they're very catchy and they stuck in my mind. Um, so we've got three characters. We've got uh, Viridian, who lives in Envelmar. He was actually sent there as a child by his Dorindan parents uh, to kind of be raised in the royal court. Um, and he's kind of training to be... Um, Train, tra training to be like a, a healer, um, a medicine person, a doctor. Then we have um, Klaus, who is part of the kind of um, spy web that, of, of Invalmar, um, which is called the Intelligences. And the Intelligences are basically the spies of Invalmar. They gather information. They have a very... Um, they, they have like a craft that they learn and that they um, evolve with uh, that helps them deal with like dangerous situations, that can, helps control their emotions. Uh, and then we have Arik, who's kind of part of the uh, warrior class and they're called the, um, and I might butcher this, I'm sorry Lamia, but I might butcher this, but it's the Isan, uh, Isan and Heri. The Isan and Heri are basically like Envomar's elite militia. They are super skilled in warfare and battle tactics. Um, and what the Envomar's have is, which is kind of the magic system uh, in, in a kind of loose kind of scent, but it's called form. And they are taught form from a very young age, uh, which is basically it's basically controlling emotions. It's it's kind of going into a zone where you are completely and utterly um, encased in your skill. So, for instance, for Klaus, it's his intelligence skill. It's his spy skill. For Arik, it's his uh, warrior skill. But it's kind of like it's almost like uh, an elevation above what a human's normal skill would be. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's hard to call it a magic system because it's very, it's almost spiritual in a way, very intellectual, very cerebral way of um, controlling and having an ability rather than this kind of external magic in a way. But yeah, so we have the, th the three main characters, Arik, Klaus and Viridian. So we begin with um, Klaus and Verdi and Arik, and they are on the run. They are running away from their homeland in Vomar for reasons that are explained uh, quite quickly at the beginning of the book, or kind of uh, laid out in brief terms, and then it, you know, then it gets explored in much more depth later in the book. Um, and they basically find themselves in Dorinda in this strange land because Envelmar is full of mountains and, you know, snow-capped mountains and forests and um, quite cold weather. And they are thrust into Dorinda, which is a dry, arid desert landscape where water is a, a, is a rare, rare commodity and is almost sacred in the fact that they have to, you know, they have to portion themselves with water. Um, and the Dorindan have learnt the ways of of kind of harnessing the water from these plants uh, called Dorinda, which is, you know, where the, where the name of the people come from. So it's this little root root of a plant that they kind of they have to dig out from the, um, from, from the desert. And Dorinda is kind of, it's in clans. So it's not, there's not a, like a government or a political structure. It's basically scattered clans that kind of claim a section of land as their own. Um, these clans have a very complex political uh, regime. They all clash with each other. They all have different ideas about how, you know, they should work together or not work together. The economic and the commerce between the clans is also very complex. Um, you know, Bayern has created such, a, a, like, it's complex, but not in the way it detracts you from reading the book. It's fascinating. It's interesting. It builds the world. It builds this beautiful, amazing, complex structure around which the characters can live and breathe and work in. And just every bit of this world just fascinated me. And like I said, it's very different from like, you know, the Western style, the Western setting, the Western geographical kind of looks and and uh, styles and feel. Uh, we're kind of in like you know Eastern Europe, Middle East type um, 
analogues really for the cultures that we're dealing with in, in Dorinda and I loved it I just I think it's absolutely fascinating I mean um Lamia Bayan, the, the author, you know, she is a Syrian surgeon who now lives um, in London. So th she's definitely taken some of that of, of who she is and where she's from and put it in this book. Absolutely for sure. And I love that, it, that it's done that because it makes for a very different read from, you know, maybe the usual or, or, or the kind of generic setting that a lot of fantasy books are set in. So coming back to the characters then. So they're on the run and they basically... Uh, have to kind of hide and integrate themselves in the Dorindan culture in and kind of get to know the culture, get to know the people. And whilst this is happening, we start to learn more about, particularly with Klaus, um, who is part of a royal family. He is next in line for the throne of Envelmar and something has happened that has basically made him run away. And it's all about the inner conflict of Klaus, uh, but also Verdi and Eric, they, they all have their kind of inner demons, their inner conflict to deal with, a very personal battle. And Bayon does a very, very good job of making this a very personal, very um, uh, insular, very intimate story, as well as being expansive and huge and massive. And she has managed to, um, create three characters that I just, I thought about every day. When I wasn't reading the book, I was thinking about those characters. And their inner struggles are very relatable in, in certain terms. You know, it's, it's struggles of identity. It's struggles of finding out who you are and where you're from. And not just in a, a geographical term, in the kind of uh, familial, in the cultural, in the spiritual sense. And these... Four lads have uh, a hell of a journey through this um, 600 and, what is it, 650 page book. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a big book. It's, you know, a lot of words on the pages. So it's 650 pages, but it, it's, uh, it's a lot of words. But I just adored going through the journey with these characters and their struggles, their battles, inner and external conflicts. Um, and also just the way it's, it's almost like, it's almost like, um, Dances with Wolves or Avatar. It's, it's kind of going native and in a way they have to do that. And with Verdi, who is actually from, initially from Dorinda, but has lived in, in, in Vilmar all his life. It's about rediscovering a people and a land and a culture that he would, that he never really was a part of. Uh, and that makes Verdi a very, very, very interesting character. Um, I think out of all three of them, Verdi changes the least by the end of the book. Whereas Klaus and Arik, for me, went through a much bigger, uh, a much bigger journey, a much bigger inner struggle um, because they are from Invalmar and because of their form, their, the, the fact that... Um, that Eric is an Iss and Harry, and the fact that Klaus is a intelligencer, and what they've had drilled into them from a very young age, and trained in the ways of Invalmar, it's much, much, it's really difficult for them to then find the doubt, the truth about their country, which is is another kind of mystery that slowly unfolds through the book, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But Verdi. Even though it does change, it's a much, much slower process and he's not quite where he needs to be by the end of this book. But all three characters are just brilliant. There's, I, I'd be hard to choose one that I preferred, to be perfectly honest. I think all three of them were written brilliantly. Um, I think Klaus, just just for me, just, just in the nature of his story, um, Probably pips the post just a little bit, but I loved all three of them. I thought it was brilliant. And then we've got like a lot of side characters um, who I absolutely love. We have a relative of Verdi who they meet quite early on when they uh, make their way into Dorinda. And that is Ali Zarin. Uh, great character. He is very set in his ways. He has a lot of secrets. He's a very hard, he's a very hard man. He barely 
shows his emotions particularly to Verdi, particularly to the lad. But there are scenes when he is with other people where he opens up a bit more. Uh, and he's very important to Verdi's journey through this book and also later on to Klaus's journey as well. So Ali Zarin is one of my favourite characters. Uh, we've also got, uh, there's also another wonderful character called Nerison who is what they call a plains walker. She's, she's very in tune with the landscape, with the desert and very much um, helping the poor villagers that are, you know, that are non-clan who are always targets to attacks by pirates. I'll get to them in a minute. Uh, but yeah, she's a, a fantastic character, becomes very important to uh, the trio's journey. And her character is wonderful. I love her character. One of my favorite kind of side characters in, in the entire book. So yeah, so that's the kind of general thing. Then in Dorinda, we basically, when the lads come into Dorinda, um, we're currently in a stage where Clans and clandoms are being attacked by uh, by desert pirates, and we don't we don't quite know where they're coming from, where they're based, who they are, and there's a sh brilliant mystery behind um, who they are and what their purpose and motivation is. Uh, brilliant, brilliant mystery, expertly kind of laid out and unraveled in a very uh, measured slow way so as not to give you too much all at once. Bayon is just so so good at just unraveling these mysteries and evolving the characters and opening us up to the different spiritual and cultural and societal ways of the desert people and it's just one of my I can't I can't put across enough how much I loved her narrative and her writing. Um, so we had the pirate people. I'm all over the place with this. I'm, I'm just, my thoughts are just going out at the minute. So there's no kind of structure to this, to this review at all. But we got these pirate people and they become, v and uh, uh, Klaus and Arik and Verdi come very much entangled up in this, trying to aid and help the, the clans and trying to, you know, trying to unravel the mystery of who the pirates are and what they want. So that's a massive part of the story as well. Um, and through this book, it, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful, the, the, there's a wonderful bit at the beginning of this book, um, which is basically said, this book is for any innocent who has been touched by war, who has felt its endless reverberations, mourned its thefts, known its myriad little griefs and wept into the void. There is hope. Now the entirety of this book has this veil of looming war about it and it's a kind of a pressure it's a it's a pressure it's a feeling of just war is about to happen any moment now and the way that Bayon conveys that through dialogue just through description just through the atmosphere and tone of the book is exquisite and it makes for I mean a brilliant lovely great read but apprehensive read as well because you know that at any point these people could face slaughter, could face murder, could face war. And it again, it makes for the immersion and the this purposeful meandering road that you walk down as you read the book. That's the best way I can describe it. And it's not meandering in the way that the narrative has a kind of loose structure that loses its way. I don't mean that in any way, but I mean that we, we meander through the character's psyches and emotions and we spend time with people we spend time in certain villages or towns and we get to know the market stalls and the shops um the the rare commodity of water and how important it is to these people it's almost like a spiritual need in some ways and it, and connected with that is the fact that bayon makes the desert and sometimes it's so corny when you say this, but it, she makes the desert a living character. The desert is sentient. The desert has, has movement and a breath that just encompasses and lifts the story, lifts the narrative, be, be part of the narrative. And I can't tell you how much it made me emotional. Just a just being with the characters, not just the characters 
reaction to the desert, but just the desert, just the desert and the way it's portrayed and conveyed in Bayan's writing and how it brings people together, how it makes people or, or the peoples that live there dependent on one another and dependent on trust and dependent on a kind of infrastructure that is based on hope and love. And as much as war looms over this book, looms over the characters and the land, there is a there is hope, and there's always hope that that threads through this story, like she says in her, in her in her kind of memorial at the beginning. And it's it's so beautifully weaved, threaded through the book, and I, I absolutely loved it. And like, I'm always looking for I'm always looking for thematic. Uh, I'm, I'm always looking for theme and thematic content in books. And boy, does Bayon give you themes. The, one of them that hit me, um, just talking about the desert there, one of them that hit me was this, that, that humans have lost a connection to the earth. They've lost this spiritual, cultural connection to the land that they live in. And it's about finding that again it's about reconnecting with nature reconnecting with the land that you live on reconnecting with its resources in, in not just a way of using those resources to live like pillaging resources which is what the pirates do but it's about the balance between using the resources and giving back to the land and the Dorindan culture is very much all about that um and you know one of our characters has to kind uh, it has to kind of learn that and appreciate that and that is one of my favorite elements of the entire story you've got themes of choice you've got a theme of identity uh which plays through all three of these uh young men and you know it's played with culturally it's played with um genetically it's played with um spiritually all these this kind of uh, identity and finding your identity finding about who you really are on different kind of terms um is fascinating throughout the book um all the time and you know it's about it's about kind of like east west culture and the clash of those cultures and how they're very different to each other but also how they can connect with each other and appreciate and come to terms with each other's beliefs uh, their ways, their mannerisms, their character, and there's a lot of and there's a lot of that in this book, and I really, really like that. I am rambling a lot, and I'm kind of jumping around with character, world building, and theme, but everything's so connected and alive in my head that I just wanted to get everything out to you. Um, this comes out on the 26th of this month, November. Read this book if you love really rich character. If you love a different setting, if you love epic fantasy, if you love deep, rich characters, if you love wonderful, tense interactions with characters and beautiful, beautiful writing. I, I can't express to you how beautiful Bayon's writing is. I, it, she, up for me, she goes up there with Tolkien and with Patrick Rothfuss just for their prose. It is beautiful, beautiful. When you read this, one piece of advice I'll give you is do not burn through this book. Read it, digest it slowly, consume it slowly, appreciate and immerse yourself in this world because I believe me, you will not be disappointed at all. It's a beautiful book. It is my book of the year. Um, I mean, we've only got, what, a month and a half-ish left of this year. I don't think this is going to be topped. This is my book of the year. Wingspan of Treason. Book one of the Sturm Singer cycle comes out on the 26th of November. Read it. Ellen Bayan is a wonderful, wonderful writer. She's a beautiful human being. Um, I've been chatting back and forth with her all month um, about various things. This is a brilliant book. Please go and read it. So thank you for bearing with me for my rambling and um, kind of all over the place review. But this book is just so fresh on my mind that the thoughts were just coming out at different miles an hour and... And sometimes I couldn't get my words out. It's, I was just so excited about this book. I cannot gush about this book anymore. But that's it for now. I'll be back quite soon with another review. And I'm also going to...
do uh, my TBR for November and December. That's coming soon as well. Until then, revel in the destruction of your TBR. See you later, beautiful people.